discussed before the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, and then we did Judaism and Islam, and now we want to do the next kind of major religion, which is Hinduism. So I want to look at the relationship between Judaism and Hinduism. And what's surprising about this is that Judaism and Hinduism, it seems like they should have nothing in common. They're completely unrelated from totally different worlds. But actually we find it's really surprising that they have a lot in common. And you wouldn't think that. So Judaism and Christianity, okay, makes sense. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, they're all part of the same tradition. Abraham and Moses and, and David, part of the, that same Abrahamic faith. But then Hinduism, what does that have to do with anything? It's like on the other side of the world, far away. So you would think that there's nothing in common, but actually there's a lot in common. And we want to explore why. And it's actually connected to, you'll see why I want to talk about it this week, because it's related to this week's Parsha also. So before we get into all these similarities between Judaism and Hinduism, we have to, of course, say the big, the, the major point, which is, of course, there is a huge difference between Judaism and Hinduism. What is the most striking difference between the two? That's right. So Judaism, of course, is very strictly monotheistic. Right? Judaism is all about the fact that there's one God. Right? We say multiple times a day that there's only one God, and God is one. And Hinduism is quite the opposite, because it's seemingly very polytheistic. There's a lot of idols, a lot of different gods, this one and that one. So you would think that that's an irreconcilable difference, that there's nothing, you can't in any way put Judaism and Hinduism together because Hinduism is so very polytheistic and Judaism is so very monotheistic. So how could they really have anything in common? Like for, uh, in Jewish definitions, uh, Hinduism would be for sure avodazara, right? total idolatry. However, however, having said that, Hindus do have this idea that ultimately everything comes from one source. So even Hindus believe that there is one cause to everything, that there is one source to everything, and that there is kind of one Godhead from which all the other supposed gods emerge. And what is that one source called? That first cause, the one source, the everything, the eternal, the oneness. Does anybody know what it's called? Brahman. Brahman. Right? Brahman is the Hindu term for that oneness, for the unity that, is, that, that binds together the whole universe. So it's kind of similar to the, I, the more Kabbalistic notion of the Ein Sof, right? that God is the, the eternal, infinite God that binds all things, that we're all really just one. And there's this illusion that we are not one. But really, everything is united. Everything is one. When we say Hashem Echad, really it means that everything is one. You and God and the cosmos, we're all part of one force. It's all one cosmos. So that idea does exist in Hinduism, and it's called Brahman. Brahman is the oneness from which everything emerges. And the Hindu priests, right? Hinduism has a caste system. Hindu society has a caste system. And at the top of the caste, who are at the top of the caste? They're the, the priests who are called the Brahmins. And so you have Brahman, who's like the one, let's say, God behind everything else, the one force behind all other forces. And the priests at the very top of Hindu society are the Brahmins. And so it's interesting as well. That's the first parallel that you have because Jewish society, ancient Israelite society, had something like a caste system where you had also three major categories, uh, the Kohanim, the priests, who are at, kind of at the top, and then the Levim, but who are somewhat beneath them, the Levim who are like the support for the Kohanim and who are more like the teachers and another sp spiritual caste, and then the, everybody else, Israel. So you had Kohanim, Levim, Israel, and Hindu society is arranged somewhat similarly, where you have the priests and then, you know, different, the ruling class and the artisans and the merchants and the laborers, and then the Hindus, of course, also have the untouchables, right? Like the very bottom of society that are like second-class citizens. We never had anything like that. Like ancient Israelite society didn't have that. But they, ha they did have something similar, which is people who were kind of excluded from the community. Who were those people? <clears throat> Lepers. Lepers might be. Also mamzer, right? A mamzer was not allowed to marry into the community. So they were kind of kept aside. So there were certain people that the Torah says that were some, in some ways excluded from society. But... 
other than them, the Kohanim are more spiritual, they are the priestly class, and you couldn't just be a priest if you wanted to. If you're not a Kohen, then you, you're not, you can't be a priest. And so Hindu society is somewhat similar, where you have like the untouchables at the bottom, you have the Brahmins at the top who are the priests. Now the big question is, what does it mean to be a Brahmin? What is Brahmin? What does this word mean? What does Brahman mean? Does anybody know what it means? Where does it come from? It's a trick question, because nobody actually knows where it comes from. There's no, if you look up the etymology of Brahman, nobody, it's a mystery word. Nobody knows where it comes from. And this is where some people have proposed that Brahman sounds very similar to Avraham. Right? And the Brahmins, it sounds like they are the disciples of Avraham. So what's the connection? How is this possible? How did we go from India to Avraham? What's the connection? Right, and that's where we come to this week's Parsha. Exactly. So let's read what it says in this week's Parsha that we're going to read, Chaye Sarah. It says, uh, it tells us about the last bit of Avraham's life. After his wife Sarah passed away, what happened to him? And Avraham remarried. He married a woman named Keturah. And of course we know... So yeah, so according to one tradition, Keturah is the same person as Hagar. So like Rashi says, if you look up, look up Rashi on this verse, that Keturah is Hagar. And the same what, like, kind of concubine he had before, the mother of Ishmael. And she was called Keturah because she was pure like the Ketoret, like the incense that they used to bring in the temple. When he divorced her or whatever, when he sent her away, she wasn't with any other man and she didn't get remarried. So she was always waiting for Avraham to take her back. So she was called Ketua. That's one tradition. A different, another tradition says, no, they're not related. It's two different people. Hagar was Hagar. She was expelled. Uh, Ketua is a different woman. So he married Keturah, and then, Zimran, and now he had all these other kids. So everybody knows about Yitzhak and Ishmael, but he had all these other kids afterwards. So he had Zimran, Vet Yokshan, Vet Medan, Vet Midian, Vet Ishbak, Vet Shuach. So it's important to mention that Midian is also one of his kids. And who came from Midian? Yitro came from Midian, and who else? His, <laughs> so Moshe. No, Moses married, Moses' wife was Tzipora, right? Tzipora was from Midian. So when Moses married Tzipora, he, he was still marrying a very distant cousin. Because Moses is the seventh generation from Avraham. And Avraham's son was Midian, from whom came Yitro and Tzipora. So when Moses married Tzipora, she was not completely foreign. She was actually a very distant cousin. So because Midian is also, it's important to remember that Midian is also a son of Avraham. And then, and then it says his grandchildren. There was Shva, Dedan, Uvnei Dedan, Ayu Ashurim, Ol Tushim, Ol Umim. So it's just pointing out how Avraham was the forefather of many different peoples in the region. Uvnei Midian, and the sons of Midian were Eifava Efer. So that's another two of his grandsons. And these are interesting, Eifava Efer, because there was an ancient Greek writer called Cleodemus who was quoted by Josephus, Cleodemus said, we mentioned this before, that Eifa and Efer are the forefathers of, they went to Africa, and they settled in Africa, and Efer is the origin of the term of Africa. The whole continent of Africa, where does the name Africa comes from? So according to Cleodemus, it actually comes from, a grandson, from the grandsons of Abraham who settled there at some point. Uh, they were called Eifa and Efer. Okay, and Vechanoch, who we talked about before. Here's another Hanoch. So Avraham also had a grandchild named Hanoch, who we talked about a month ago. And Avida, Elda, Kol Ele Bnei Keturah. And then this is the interesting part. Ve'iten Avraham et kol asher lo le'itzchak. So Avraham gave everything he had, he left it to Yitzchak. His whole inheritance, the land, everything was left to Yitzchak. Ve'livnei apilagshim, and to these other children that he had, from the concubine, asher le'avraham, natan Avraham matanot, he gave them gifts. He just gave them other gifts. And, And he sent them away from Yitzchak because he didn't want there to be any dispute over who owns what. It should be clear that the land of Israel belongs to Yitzchak, that the whole inheritance belongs to Yitzchak. So he sent all the other children away. While he was still alive, Kedma, he sent them Kedma to the east. El Eretz Kedem. So Avram had all these other children and grandchildren. And before he passed away, he made sure to send them all away. But he gave them matanot. He gave them presents. 
And if you look up the commentaries on what matanot means, various different commentaries, they all say more or less the same thing, that he gave them various spiritual presents. Not anything physical, but he gave them spiritual presence, spiritual wisdom, different ideas as to what exactly he taught them. Uh, some even say that he taught them the names of various idols to be aware of. And, or he taught them some black magic, or he taught them various spiritual forces that would protect them. So he taught them something spiritual. In any case, they were his children, his grandchildren, and we can assume they were his disciples, and he sent them far to the east. Okay, and how far east? doesn't say. But the furthest east in Tanakh, what is the furthest east mentioned in Tanakh? Hodu. Hodu. We read in Megillat Esther, when Megillat Esther in the Tanakh wants to describe the vastness of the Persian Empire of Ahasuerus, it says, Mi Hodu at Kush. Kush is Africa, so from Africa in the west to Hodu in the east. So the extent of the Tanakh's you know, knowledge, or at least explicit knowledge of the world that it tells us is from Kush, from Africa, to Hodu, to India. So he sent them far east, and the farthest east you can go in Tanakh is Hodu. So this is where there is this connection. Some have proposed that perhaps it was Avraham who sent his children, grandchildren, perhaps other disciples far east to spread the word. He was a monotheist. He was teaching the world about this whole idea of one God, and he sent his children, grandchildren, disciples to the far east, and they brought this knowledge of the God of Abraham to India. And perhaps that's why they're called Brahmins. And their, their god is Brahman, which is really the god of Abraham. And hence the alliteration, why the name sounds so similar between Avraham and Brahman. That's the idea. Whether that's a historical fact or not, we can't say, but it does fit in neatly with the idea of Avraham being, like the Torah says, Av Hamon Goim, that God promised to Avraham that you're going to be the forefather of many nations. Originally, he was called Avram which means just of Aram, that he was a father in this area of Aram. And then he became, God added a He into his name. He became Avraham because the He is Hamon Goim, that he is the father of many, many nations. So we typically think that means he's the spiritual father of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. But also, if you follow this idea, also of, of Hindus and of the whole Indian subcontinent uh, would also be somehow spiritually descended from Avraham from all his other children and grandchildren that went to the Far East. So that's the setup. So now the question is, how exactly are Judaism and Hinduism similar? What are some things that we have in common? Mm -hmm. What's that? Yeah, okay, I'll get to that. But like what, in terms of practically, what do we have in common? It's true. So actually, some years ago, I was reading a National Geographic, and they did a survey of which religions have the most holidays. And the two that came out at the front, at the top, were Hinduism and Judaism. Now, National Geographic gave the title to Hinduism as being number one and Judaism as being number two. However, however, they did not count Rosh Chodesh as a holiday. <laughs> and they didn't count Shabbat. Because the truth is, for us, Shabbat, Shabbat's a big holiday, right? Shabbat is like the biggest holiday in many ways. So like what we do for Shabbat is like, you know, what Christians do only twice a year on Christmas and Easter. We do that every week. You know, you have the whole family and you shut off all the electronics and you pray and you go to the synagogue and you do all these rituals and pray. And, but they didn't count National Geographic, didn't count Rosh Chodesh and Shabbat. So if you count those, then we win by a, a long shot. But uh, <laughs> so one, that's true. We do have a lot of holidays in common, Judaism and Hinduism, because compared to that, like Islam and Christianity have very little holidays. They only really have like two major holidays each and maybe some other minor holidays. But we all have like 30 plus days. Jews and Hindus have at least 30 days of holiday over the course of the year, depending on what you count exactly as a holiday. So that's, that's a big one. Anything else? Any other ideas? For sure, meditation, although that's true for a lot of religions. But yeah, like prayer meditation, that's definitely true. And I'll talk more about that later on. So in terms of our very structure, if you look at our religions, first of all, Judaism and Hinduism are kind of like the two most ancient religions in the world. They're both at least 3,000 years old, arguably 4,000 years old, probably the two oldest religions, continuous religions that, that are still alive today. Some might add Zoroastrianism as well. Maybe those would be like the top three, although Zoroastrianism is very small. There's even less Zoroastrians, Zoroastrians than Jews in the world, but also an ancient religion. 
So we're both very ancient. And we have actually, our history is really similar because Hindu religion starts with the most ancient Hindu texts are called the Vedas, right? the Vedas, and they're probably around 3,000 years old. And the Vedas also, they're arranged in four books. So it's kind of like we have the, the foundations of Judaism is the Chumash, the Torah of Moses. We have five books of Moses, which date back at least 3,000 years or three and a half thousand years, something like that. The Vedas are in the same. There's four books of Vedas. So instead of a Chumash, they have four. Instead of five, they have four. And they date back also to about three, three and a half thousand years. And just like the Chumash, or similar to the Chumash, a lot of the Vedas are about sacrifices. And they used to, Hindus used to bring sacrifices. So today, Hindus for the most part are vegan or vegetarian. They don't eat cow, beef, but they used to. They used to bring actually cow sacrifices. There was a time when they used to do that. And eventually that was kind of outlawed and stop being practiced. Again, similar to Judaism, where we used to have a very rich tradition, many rituals of sacrifices. And then when the second temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago, sacrifices basically stopped. And since then, Judaism has no sacrifices. And again, that's similar to Hinduism, which once actually had many sacrifices and stopped doing that for the most part. Although I saw that in Nepal, they still have sacrifices. And apparently they do like a massive festival every five years where they slaughter like hundreds of thousands of animals. So the core, you know, like the, the core of Judaism is the Torah of Moses, five books that go back, you know, some three and a half thousand years. The core of Hinduism is a set of four books that go back three, three and a half thousand years. And also similar where they deal with a b bunch of things, laws, history mixed with ritual, mysticism, sacrificial laws, all that together. So a lot in common. And I'll quote a little bit from it later and you'll see how similar the wording is. The sacrifices that we used to do and we don't do anymore. And also Hindus consider the Vedas to be divine and not human of human origin. Just like we say the Humash is divine and not of you. Although Moses wrote it, he was just basically, it was dictated by God and Moses wrote it. What's a big thing for Hindus now that we're talking about sacrifices? What's like hin Hinduism famous for? The holy cow, right? For Hindus, the cow is a sacred animal. And where do we see a parallel to that in Judaism? Oh, I get it. Close, close. It's true. So, okay, so good. These are good ideas. So it's true that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they had this huge sin that they worshiped the golden calf, although it wasn't, most of the Israelites didn't do it. It was a small, maybe 3,000 people, the Torah says, that actively participated. So there is, that's an idolatry of worshiping a, a golden calf. Uh, but then related to that, though, there is another cow or calf in Judaism, red, red. the red cow, right? The paraduma, the red heifer, the red heifer which was actually, according to many commentaries, God commanded the law of the red heifer, the red cow, to atone for the golden calf. And so in, in Hinduism, the cow is holy, it's not consumed, and it's considered to be an animal that's sacred, and that's actually purifying. So, and there's five things, five products of the cow that are considered purifying, depending on how you use them. What are those five products? In Hinduism, not in Judaism, in Hinduism. What, what are they? Anybody know? So the milk, the milk, the curd, ghee, which is like butter, essentially, something like that, like oil, like a buttery oil, and then urine, and dung. Okay, so in Hinduism, the dung of the cow and the urine of the cow is purifying and believed to be healing. And I don't know if you know this, but maybe you caught this a couple of years ago during COVID. People were talking about how in India, people thought drinking cow urine would prevent... COVID and was, so maybe it does, I don't know. Uh, but uh, that was going around that they were recommending to drink urine. So funny story, I used to, to do a lot of tu tutoring and like science tutoring, you know, high school students, university students. And most of my students were Asian, basically, Chinese, Indian, Sri Lankan. And so you get to know the families. And so one time I had one family that was, I believe, Sri Lankan, very religious. And every time I would come, like in the evenings, the mother would always go to the temple. So she'd be like dressed up in the sari. It was really nice. Right? And we'd always like, we'd talk about it. She'd tell me about it. Because, you know, she sees I'm religious, you know, with the kippah. And she's like in her thing. So one time I came and she was going to her temple. And the rest of the family wasn't religious. You know, the dad was watching TV. She was going to the temple. 
And uh, so I was with the son. We were like doing chemistry and biology. And then the husband's watching TV and the mom's going to temple. And so I said, oh, well, what is it today? She's going to the temple. She's like, oh, today is some festival with the, about, about the holy cow. And I was like, oh, you know, like in Judaism, we have something similar about a purifying cow, you know, whatever, the ashes of the cow. And this is what she told me. It's fun. She said, oh, do you drink the urine too? <laughs> and I, I said, no, we don't go that far. But, uh, you know, so. Yeah, this is the dog put on the fire. Also that. Yeah, also that, also that. But then some of them actually like use it in various. Each of these five things is used in various ways as a purification agent. So, yeah. so that's the urine and the dung. So there's five things in Hinduism that are supposed to be purifying from the cow. Now the Torah law of the red heifer is it's you actually have to kill it and you have to slaughter it and burn it and then the ashes are purifying. And this is actually the most purifying thing that you have because only the ashes, that mixture prepared from the ashes of the red cow is the only thing that can purify all impurity, including the highest impurity, which is the impurity of death. So to mat met, the impurity of death is considered to be the highest level of impurity. We are all considered to have that impurity today because we don't have the ashes of the red cow. So we have, we can purify by doing like mikveh and certain things that we can do, but we don't have the ashes of the red cow to get rid of the greatest impurity, which is the impurity of death. So if you've ever been to a cemetery or next to a dead body, then you have that impurity of death. Yeah, and so the belief in Judaism is when Mashiach comes, we'll have a red cow and we'll be able to make the ashes, uh, the mixture, and we'll, we'll be able to purify everybody. Although the truth is you don't need Mashiach to do it. There's always red cows. They find them all the time. There's a bunch of red cows in Israel. They groom them. Uh, a lot of American farmers in the South, like religious Christians, are always on the lookout for a, a red heifer. And they brought a whole bunch of them to Israel a few years ago. So we have the cows. We just need, I guess, Mashiach. Or some, yeah, the cows are there. Uh, although, again, you, technically you don't need Mashiach. Like anybody, any Kohen... Any group of Kohanim who are, know about the laws could do it. And the Temple Institute it, it, today in Israel exists, and they technically could do it. So it just needs the willpower and uh, people to accept it as valid and, and actually make it happen. So that's the holy cow. And we both have this connection uh, or this similarity in that we believe that there's something about cows that has a purifying power, a very high purifying power. Yeah, of course, a cow is not inherently sacred in Judaism like it is in Hinduism, but there is something purifying about the cow. Another way that we purify, so right now, today, we don't have the ashes of the red heifer. So what is the way that we generally purify? Mikveh, mikveh right? We use water, we use the mikveh, and it has to be a natural body of water, like a river, whatever it is, a natural gathering place of water. And it, that's another thing that's similar in Hinduism, where a river is a purifying thing. In particular, one particular river purifies everything, which is the Ganges. Right? The Ganges River is considered like a holy river, and many Hindus will pilgrimage to the Ganges to basically do a tvila, to dunk in the, in the Ganges, or to, to dump the ashes of some cremated uh, beloved person because the Ganges is considered to be purifying as well. So there's another connection there of using water immersion as purification. Another thing that's interesting is that Judaism is famous for having a written Torah and an oral Torah. We have the Torah Shebikhtav, which is the five books of Moses, plus the other 19 books of the Tanakh, the written Torah. And then we have the oral Torah, which was oral traditions that were passed down for centuries and that were eventually recorded. Mishnah, Talmud, we know that. That's written in oral Torah. Hindus have the same setup. So Hindu religion, they have a, what's a, a so-called written Torah, so to speak, and a oral Torah. So the written Torah is what they call Shruti. Shruti is what, something like the Vedas, an authoritative text. It doesn't have a specific author. It's considered to be divine. And then they have many later texts, which are called Smriti, which is what is remembered, what does have an author, it does have a name. It's brought down in the name of some person based on an oral tradition, an ancient oral tradition. So they also have what we call it written and oral. They call it what is heard and what is remembered. What is heard is like the ancient texts, the Vedas, the written ones that are considered to be divine. And then what is remembered is oral traditions that were passed down, that were brought in the name of some person, some great sage of the past. So you can see how that's similar 
to what we have, a Tanakh, a Torah Shebechtav, and an oral Torah where various rabbis and sages in the name, bring teachings in the name of rabbis and sages. Right? Like what is, so to speak, what is remembered, and what was repeated. Mishnah literally means repetition because it was actually done by memory, where they would remember the oral Torah, committed to memory, eventually it was written down. So that setup where we have in Judaism of written and oral Torah, they have something quite similar in Hinduism as well, of what is heard and what is remembered, of something written, both are now written, but something that's authoritative, considered divine, and then something based on traditions. And then part of that is there's a whole mystical tradition. So just like in Judaism, we have Kabbalah, we have all the deeper secrets that were kept hidden for a long period of time and then slowly started to be revealed you know, in the last really thousand years. So Hinduism has something very similar where there's a big mystical aspect to it. There's a big part of reincarnation, of course. Right? Hinduism is famous for reincarnation. And Judaism has a lot of reincarnation, although a lot of people don't know this. But reincarnation, what we call Gilgulim, is very central to Judaism. And if you read a book like the Arizal Shara Gilgulim, or even better, I, I think is even clearer, there's a book by Rabbi Menachem Azaria Difano. It's also about 500 years old. Sefer Gilgulei Neshamot. So there's Shara Gilgulim and Sefer Gilgulei Neshamot. So the Sefer Gilgulei Neshamot is actually goes in alphabetical order. I, I encourage all of you to read it. I don't know if there's an English version, but in Hebrew, it just goes out. Is there an English one? Okay, great. So there's an English one. So it goes in alphabetical order, like Aleph, and everybody who's in the Torah, and even later figures who are named with Aleph, who is he the reincarnation of and why? And who's is the reincarnation of and why? And when you read it, it's like you're blown away because it's so amazing and it's so perfect. And you start making sense of all these people in Tanakh and even later, even in the Talmud. And like, oh, why did this, in this bizarre story, why did this happen? And then it'll explain that, well, this person was a reincarnation of that person and that's why that happened to them. And you're like, oh, that makes so much sense. Right? So it actually clarifies, the whole idea of reincarnation in Judaism clarifies so much a lot of these like, strange, bizarre stories in Tanakh, like why did things happen to certain people, reincarnation can explain it. So reincarnation is actually a big part of Judaism. The Arizal 500 years ago was like all about reincarnation, that most souls come back and have another go at life, and usually they reincarnate three times. I don't want to go into the mechanics of reincarnation, but generally the way it works, as the Arizal explained, based on verses in the Torah. Like when we say in the 13 attributes, Hashem, Hashem, El Rachum Vechanun, Erech Apayim Baruch Hazemet, Notzer Chesed Lealafim, that he extends his kindness to thousands, right? And then Nosav on the Fesha, and he passes down the sins of the fathers, Al Banim, right? What does it say? Al Shileshim, Al Ribaim, that he passes the sins of the fathers onto the children to the third and fourth generations, Al Shileshim, Al Ribaim. But that makes no sense. Why does that make no sense? that God takes the sins of the parents and passes it down to the children to the third and fourth generation. Why does that not make sense? Because the Torah also says, Ish becheto yumat, that every person dies for their own sins. There's no such thing as, because my parents sinned, I have to suffer. I didn't do it. So the Arizal is saying the secret of that verse to the third and fourth generation, it, what it really means is that you get reincarnated three times, up to three times, if you get worse with each reincarnation. So it's secretly, mean, what it means when it says he, God takes the sins of the fathers onto the children, what it really means is he takes the sins from your past life and passes them on to this life. Like your, your spiritual father, like who you were in a past life, the sins of your past life come to this one and it can go up to three times if you get worse with each reincarnation. So God gives you another chance, you reincarnate, if you got worse the second time, he gives you another chance. If you got worse again, he gives you another chance. So you have four possible incarnations. Assuming that you're getting worse. But what if you don't get worse? What if you improve? That's where it goes, Notzer Chesed Lalafim. So God extends this kindness to thousands. Meaning as long as you get better with each incarnation, you can reincarnate thousands of times. If you're improving. So God wants to see improvement. But if you're degenerating each time, then you get three chances. And that's why the 13 attributes of, of, of mercy, of, of God, it says, al shileshim wa al ribaim, that God gives you up to three or four chances to improve. And then if not, you're done. Then that's when you would go to other places like Gehenom, like hell for 
you need a, you know, rehab or something. You need to go to a place where, yeah, you, that's it. You don't get any more chances to come here. So reincarnation is central to Judaism. Although back in the day, there were some people who opposed it, like Sadia Gaon, probably the most famous rabbi about 1,100 years ago, 1,200 years ago, who opposed it was Sadia Gaon. Sadia Gaon said, there is no reincarnation in Judaism. It's not true. It's a Hindu idea that came that Jews adopted from India or something, you know. So Rav Sadia Gaon, who was a really big, important rabbi about 1,200 years ago, he didn't hold by reincarnation. But later rabbi said, no, he only said that because he was just not exposed to it. He wasn't exposed to Jewish mysticism. That was in the time before the Zohar was published, before the Arizal. So at that time, all these manuscripts were, in, were secret, and Rav Sadia Gaon just wasn't exposed to it, so he didn't know about it. If he would have been exposed to it, he couldn't have denied it. And, and I agree with that, because again, if you read a book like Sefer Gilgulei Neshamot, there's no way you're going to deny reincarnation, because it's so obvious that it's everywhere throughout the Torah. It explains everything so beautifully that you can't really understand any Tanakh figure without factoring in reincarnation. So it's super important. And so there's an interesting Hasidic teaching. It's kind of funny. It's ironic. So the, there's a Hasidic tradition that Sadia Gaon sinned by refu- rejecting reincarnation. So what was his tikkun? What was his rectification? He was reincarnated as the Baal Shem Tov. Because right? the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, was all about reincarnation. Right? And there's many stories of the Baal Shem Tov who went around and would do certain rituals to free sparks that were trapped in various animals, you know, I'm sure you've heard these stories in a horse, maybe in a river or whatever. He did various blessings and prayers and and tikkunim to elevate souls that had sinful souls that reincarnated in animals and things like that. So there's a Hasidic tradition that the Baal Shem Tov was a reincarnation of Sadia Gaon. That was his tikkun for in a past life, rejecting the notion of, of reincarnation. So that, today, probably the two biggest religions that hold by reincarnation is Hinduism and Judaism, at least the more Kabbalistic aspects of Judaism, reincarnation is big in both. Other mystical texts, the, the main body of mystical texts in Hinduism, they're called the Upanishads. You can get a copy today, translated into English. It's fascinating to read. And I, I'll, point, I'll pull, uh, pull out some of the verses from the Upanishads that I read that I just, as I was reading this, I thought, wow, this is like reading something from the Torah, something from the Gemara. So look what it says, the Katha Upanishad. It says like this, there's three main duties of a person. The three main duties of a person. And this is what it says, I quote. It said, the Katha Upanishad says, the three main duties of a person, I quote, studying the scriptures, ritual worship, and giving alms to those in need. All right, what does that sound like? It sounds exactly like Pirkei Avot, right? Shimon HaTzadik, what? Al Shlosha Dvarim HaOlam HaMed, right? Al HaTorah, Ve'al HaVodah, Ve'al Gminut HaSadim. So Shimon HaTzadik taught in Pirkei Avot that the three most important things in the world is Torah, Torah study, Avodah, which is divine service, worship, and act of kindness, Gmilut Chasadim. And the Katha Upanishad says the same thing. Study the scriptures, ritual worship, give alms to those in need, Gmilut Chasadim. It's the same thing. Right? Amazing. The Ch- uh, Chandogya Upanishad says, uh, describes Om. You know Om? They, when they meditate, they say Om, right? Om. What is, what, what's the Om all about? So Om is called the primordial sound. It's the sound of creation. That's the mantra of Brahman. Brahman, the oneness, the one, you know, the Ein Sof. The, the syllable of the Ein Sof of Brahman is Om. And what does it say? I quote, with the word Om, we say, I agree and fulfill desires. We, with Om, we recite, we give direction, we sing aloud the honor of that word, the key to the three kinds of knowledge. This universe comes forth from Brahman, exists in Brahman, and will return to Brahman. Verily, all is Brahman. So that's what Om means. Like when you're meditating and you're saying Om, it's all about recognizing the oneness, that everything is in that we're all part of one energy, it's all one. It's like saying Hashem Echad, like, you know, Uhaya, Uhove, Uhiye, Hashem means Ayahove Hiye, past, present, future, everything, God is everywhere, and we're all part of that oneness. And it says that Om means also like I agree, it's an affirmation, 
which is the same as amen. When we say amen, it's the same thing. Somebody says a blessing, prayer, you say amen, you're saying I agree. It's an affirmation. So om and amen actually have the same spiritual origin, same as emuna. Emuna is all about the faith, seeing everything is one, the oneness of reality. That's all emuna, seeing God in all things. But what's even more amazing than that, om in Judaism, om is one of the names of God. Uh, you've, have you heard, heard of the 72 names of God? In Kabbalah, there's something really important. God has many names. We believe really the whole Torah is names of God. On the deepest kind of Kabbalistic level, the whole Torah is just a meditation of different names of God from beginning to end. And so there's a place in the Torah in Shemot, in Exodus, where there's three verses, consecutive verses, that all have 72 letters. They all have exactly 72 letters, three in a row. Okay, it's the verses that talk at the splitting of the sea. It says, mm-hmm. That God lifted a, a cloud before them, and so on. So what it's that verse, there's three verses, and each of the three verses has 72 letters. And so there's a Kabbalistic thing where a very deep, like mystical ancient secret that you take the first letter of the first verse, the last letter of the second verse, and the first letter of the third verse, and that's one name of God. It's a three-letter name of God. And then you take the second letter, and then the second to last letter, and the second letter, and you put them together. That's the next name of God. Then you take the third one from the front, the third one from the back, and the third one, and you put together, and there's a chart of 72 names. Okay? Sometimes it's called like the 216-letter name because it's 72 times three letters. Each name of God has three letters. And one of those names of God is Om, Aleph Vav Mem. Om, Aleph Vav Mem. So it actually is one of the Kabbalistic names of God. So it's another interesting parallel. So if you were to meditate on Om, there is actually a Kabbalistic meditation where you would meditate on each of the 72 names and visualize it, those three letters in your mind. And so one of them inevitably is Om. So it's another very clear overlap between Hinduism and Judaism. And by the way, in the list of the 72 names of God, which number do you think Om is? It's number 30. And I only point that out because how do you write Om? Like the Sanskrit symbol for Om. Have you seen this? You know the symbol for Hinduism? It looks like a 30, right? It's like... It looks like a 30, so I just thought that was really cute, that the Sanskrit way to write Om is like a 30, and it's the 30th of the 72 names in the Hebrew version is Om. And so that leads me to the next thing that we have in common, which is gematria and numerology and numbers. Right? Hinduism has a lot of numerology. Judaism has a lot of numerology and gematria. And more than that, Hindus invented our number system. The numbers that we use today are Hindi numerals, they are famous for introducing the use of the, of the number zero, which was a big deal, and using zero in mathematics. So the Hindus were way advanced in math 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago. A lot of the foundational concepts of mathematics came from the Hindus through the Arabs. The Arabs really bridged you know, Europe and India. And it was actually a bunch of rabbis that introduced it to Europe because who were the people that knew both Arabic <coughs> and European languages, and Latin, and Spanish, and Greek, the, the people who bridged the two worlds were a bunch of Sephardi Jews. Because the Sephardi Jews in Spain, they spoke Arabic, and they also spoke Spanish. So there's a number of rabbis that are credited with transferring Hindu mathematics to Europe and creating a, a boom in mathematical knowledge in Europe in the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. So the Ibn Ezra is one, Avraham Ibn Ezra, who was one of the Sephardi chief rabbis and wrote a famous commentary on the Torah. And the Ibn Ezra introduced, was one of the people that introduced Hindi numerals and Hindi mathematics to Europe. There's a crater on the moon named after him because of that. There's an Ebenezer crater on the moon. So one day when we all live on the moon, you might want to buy a house in the Ebenezer crater on the Ebene- Ebenezer quarter of the moon. Uh, another person was, we mentioned him a, f- a few months ago, Avraham Barchia, another very famous Sephardi rabbi, Avraham Barchia, who was the first to introduce, the first time we see the quadratic formula in Europe was introduced by Rav Avraham Barchia. And also, 
the quadratic formula, we f first find it the most ancient, the earliest we see it is in India, and the earliest that we see it in Europe, in the West, is from a treatise by Avraham Barchia. So if you do, like me, grade 12 chemistry, you're going to do a lot of quadratic formulas. I don't know if you remember this from high school. Uh, maybe you deliberately erased it from your brain <laughs> because that long formula. But yeah, so the quadratic formula was first, we see it first in India, in the East, and in the West, we see it first among rabbis, Sephardi rabbis. It's very interesting. So there is that. Numbers, numerology, the number zero, which again, our rabbis spoke about zero. And what do you think they called the zero? They called it a galgal, right? Like a circle. Today in modern Hebrew, it's called Ephes. And do you know where that comes from? In modern Hebrew, the word for zero is Ephes. Right? In, in rabbinic text, it's called the galgal, the circle. In modern Hebrew, it's called Ephes. You know where that comes from? Nothing. Yeah, from where? It has, to, it has its source in the Torah. So it comes from when Yosef was in Egypt and he gathered all the grain. Remember, Joseph gathered all the grain and then the famine started and people had no food. So then they came to Yosef for food, and this is what they said. It says in Bereshit, uh, that the Egyptians had no money left. And the Canaanites had no money left. And all the Egyptians came to Joseph, and they said, Give us bread, give us food. Why should we die? We have nothing left. And this is what they said. Ephes Kasef, we have zero money. When the Egyptians and Canaanites saw their bank statement and it said a zero, big fat zero on it. So they said, they told Yosef, Ephes Kasef, we have no money left. So it's zero. So we, you see a, an ancient source for zero, again, in, in the Torah and in ancient Hindu uh, texts. Okay, the last one, this is the big one. And then we'll conclude. The big one, in, especially if you like yoga. What's a big thing uh, in yoga when it comes to like centering yourself and meditating on the, the various things in your body? The breath and what do we associate all these things with? There's this whole notion of chakras, right? Of having various chakras, depending on who you ask, there might be five or six or seven chakras, not more than seven from what I've seen. A chakra is, literally means a wheel and it's supposed to represent a certain energy in your body, a channel, you know, a place, a concentration of, of energy, of force. It's something to meditate on. And in short, the parallel to that in Judaism, what is always, yeah, which is the spherot, right? We have in Kabbalah, all of Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah is based on the idea of spherot, of 10 divine energies, three higher ones and seven lower ones. The three higher ones are called the mochin, the intellectual ones, and the seven lower ones, the midot, and so you have 10 divine energies that God blew into this universe that the whole universe is permeated with. And it's a way for us to basically understand everything, right? They are within us. They are within the cosmos around us. They contain the whole universe. Um, like the kind of the edges of the physical universe are held by the sfilot, which are kind of like or arranged in concentric rings or spheres around the whole cosmos. In fact, the English word sphere which comes from the Greek sphera, is thought to have a shared etymology with the Hebrew sphira. So sphira and sphere actually have some ancient connection because it was all about concentric spheres of energy around the cosmos. And chakra is similar because it means a wheel. And if you actually look at them, there's so much in common. The first chakra at the very top is called the crown chakra. And the first of the spherot is called ketel. Keter literally means a crown, right? So it's the same. And the crown chakra is associated with the skull, and Keter is associated with the skull, right? And then within the skull is the brain, which for us is Chabad, Chokhmah, Bina, Da'at. And those are called Dalid Mochin. Those are the four aspects of the higher spherot. You have Keter, Chokhmah, Bina, and Da'at. And that's, by the way, in Tefillin, you know the Tefillin, it has four parchments, the head tefillin has four compartments. The arm tefillin has one compartment, and the head tefillin has four compartments. So if you look at what the Arizal says, he says that the head tefillin has four compartments to correspond to the Dalid Mochin, right, to the four aspects of the, the higher spherot. And so in Hinduism, 
you have the first chakra is the crown chakra, and then the second one after that is called the third eye chakra. Because, you know, there's the third eye thing. You know how Hindus put the little red dot? Mm-hmm. And the red dot is it's also ornamental, but it's supposed to also be like a channel into the brain, into the inner third eye. Because we all have an inner spiritual third eye in addition to our two physical eyes. So the whole idea of the third eye is really big in Hinduism. And believe it or not, it's actually also important in Jewish mysticism. And that's actually the tefillin on a Kabbalistic level. Tefillin is supposed to channel that third eye, the spiritual eye. And that's why the Torah says to put it between your eyes. Even though it's not, we don't put it literally between our eyes. But it's supposed to channel your inner third eye. Now, this all sounds very like mystical, but do we actually physically have such a structure? Is there in your brain a third eye? Exactly, the pineal gland. So there is a part in your brain, deep in your brain, there's a little organ called the pineal gland. And what's amazing is that it has photoreceptors. The pineal gland has the same cells that are in your eyes that absorb light, photoreceptors. Your pineal gland has photoreceptors, which is bizarre, right? It's deep in your brain, and yet it has receptors, light receptors, like your eyes do. And in birds, the pineal gland is really up high, right at the base, like right under the, the, the skull. And so it actually does pick up sunlight and it helps them navigate. So in birds and reptiles, the pineal gland's up top. For us, it's deep inside. So we don't use it to pick up light, but it still has photoreceptors in it. So it literally is like a third eye. And what's amazing is the pineal gland, its main job in your body is to put you to sleep. It releases melatonin. Melatonin is the sleep hormone. So the pineal gland is what actually regulates your circadian rhythm. That's what regulates your, that's how your body knows it has a 24 hour cycle. Even if you didn't look at your clock, your body has a natural circadian rhythm. And the pineal gland is the main organ that keeps your body's clock going. And it releases melatonin in the evening. It gets you tired, puts you to sleep. And then you wake up when the melatonin levels drop. So that's the pineal gland. I actually first learned about this uh, from one of the world's experts, actually, at York University. There's a fourth-year course about biological timekeeping circadian rhythms. And there's a professor there, Colin Steele, who is actually does research in, on the pineal gland and on circadian rhythms. And I tried to work in his lab, but he didn't take me. So, but the class was fascinating nonetheless. So the pineal gland releases melatonin, puts you to sleep, very important, really small, and it has photoreceptors like an eye. But what's even more interesting for spiritual things is that it also has something called DMT, mm-hmm. dimethyltryptamine, which is... God some call it the God molecule or the spirit molecule. Some people take it as a drug. Uh, in Native American shaman rituals, they do brew ayahuasca tea. Maybe you've heard of ayahuasca. It has DMT and it's supposed to open up your mind and it's very psychedelic and makes people uh, hallucinate and, and some people say they see God or they hear messages, they receive prophecy. And so various cultures around the world actually use DMT. Some people say that also in Hinduism, Hindu ancient texts talk about something called Soma, which is like, you know, the drink of the gods or something like that. And some people say that, some people think that Soma, we don't know what it is, but some people think that Soma had DMT. Uh, in fact, I know one rabbi who has a tradition, and he's done a lot of research into this. I'm not going to say his name because I don't think he wants people to know who he is. But uh, he's done a lot of research in Judaism on DMT, and he has a tradition going back to the Vilna Gaon that looks, uh, looks into DMT from a Jewish perspective. And perhaps what the tree that was used in the Mishkan, Atzei Shittim, uh, apparently those trees have a high amount of DMT as well. So perhaps there was a DMT connection in the Tanakh, in our tradition as well. And the the pineal gland has DMT. So your brain naturally produces some of it, and it's believed that that's what helps you dream. That's what makes you dream. That's what gives you your dream visions. And that's why dreams can be so powerful and can be prophetic. So it's the same DMT. So you don't really need the drugs. You know, and both Hinduism and Judaism agree that you shouldn't take drugs to get to that level of prophecy because you do have it in your brain. And you can upregulate, you can, your, you can actually train your brain to release more DMT and help you see more spiritual things. Very interesting side story. There was only one 
researcher in the US that was given permission by the government to research DMT and experiment on people, give them DMT and see what happens. His name is Rick Strassman. He is like the world's number one most famous DMT researcher. And Rick Strassman was born Jewish, became a Buddhist, was like a Buddhist monk for like 20 years. And he wrote a book called The Spirit Molecule. He's a scientist and he wrote all about he did this research on hundreds of people with DMT, and he believes that it is the spirit molecule, that it has something to do with prophecy. And what's interesting, in recent years, Rick Strassman, who was a Buddhist for 20 years, became a Baal Tshuva. And now he wrote a book called DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, and he argues that the Hebrew prophets, the prophets of the Tanakh, had DMT-like visions based on his... Uh, studies on DMT. So very interesting figure, somebody who realized after 20 years as a Buddhist that that's not the right path and that he came back to Judaism. Uh, So that's the thing with with DMT, interesting story. And DMT is in the pineal gland, the third eye chakra, the pineal gland in your brain, the tefillin is supposed to channel the same thing. Kabbalistic texts say that this is the mystery of the Torah saying that Bilam, remember Bilam, that he was shtum ein, that he had a closed eye, that Kabbalistic texts say the closed eye was his inner eye, was his third eye, you know, in, in the brain. And the Arizal says that tefillin is supposed to channel that same energy, the inner light in your brain. And the Arizal says that's why tefillin has to be made of leather. Because how do you say leather in Hebrew? Oh, right? Oh with an ein. And he says that's really like oh with an aleph means light. So it's supposed to remind you that it's actually about the inner light in your brain in the mochin, the dalid mochin, deep in your brain. So even the, the tefillin is on a very deeper mystical level, supposed to channel the third eye. And King Solomon also alluded to this. King Solomon said in Kohelet, he said, Hechacham enav berosho. The wise man, his eyes are in his head. So the Zohar says, what do you mean the, his eyes are in his head? The Zohar actually says there's like, it's the, the eye in your head, your inner third eye. That's what King Solomon was saying that the wise man has his eyes in his head, Berosho. So it's all alluded to secretly in the, in the Torah. So that's the third eye chakra. And then you have the throat chakra. The throat chakra is what we would, in, in, the, zo, in uh, the tree of life, in the Sfirot, that would be Tiferet. Tiferet is about the breath, and that's where air flows through, and that's at the center of all the other Sfirot. And then you have the heart chakra, which is like chesed, which is all about love and compassion and all that. And then you have the solar chakra, which is about fear. So it's the gvura, it's the pachad, it's the din, it's the opposite. So it's very similar to the way that we look at sfirot, is this description of chakras. And they have the sacral chakra, which is yesod, which is everything with reproduction. And then the root chakra at the very bottom, which is like malchut, and that's associated with the mouth. Just like in patach Eliyahu, we say malchut peh, malchut associated with the mouth. So the chakras... And the Sfirot have a lot in common. There's so much similar between Judaism and Hinduism, in some ways even more than with Christianity and Islam, which are really our, our closer cousins. But there's a lot in common between Judaism and Hinduism. So how do we put it all together? A Yehudi, a Jew is a Yehudi, and a Hindu is a Hodi. Right? It's spelled the same way, but with one letter difference. Right? The Yehudi has a Yud in front. The Hodi is like the Yehudi without the Yud. So if you take the, the God part, if you take Hashem, the yud heh vav heh, out of Judaism, then you have the Hinduism, right? You have, once you take it out and you make it polytheistic, you have the Hodi, right? The, the, the Jew is like the Hodi with God, with the one God. Even in our names, there's a connection between the Hodi and the Yehudi. And in fact, we were connected throughout history. It seems like we were so separated, but actually our histories intertwine. And the Talmud even has, this is interesting, the first time I saw this, I was blown away. But in Masachet Kiddushin, it says that there was a rabbi, his name was, is what it says, Rabbi Yehuda Hindua, Rabbi Yehuda the Hindu. There was a rabbi 2,000 years ago, a bit less, 1,500 years ago, who was called Rabbi Yehuda the Hindu. And the Talmud says, Rabbi Yehuda Hindua, Ger she'en lo yorshin hava. He was a ger, he was a convert. There was a Hindu man who converted to Judaism, and he didn't just convert, he became a rabbi. He was a big enough rabbi to be mentioned in the Talmud. And the Talmud brings him to say that because he converted and he had no family, so he had no yorshin, he had no inheritors. So the Talmud brings his case to, to explore what happens when a convert passes away, what happens to all of their stuff. 
because if they don't have family and they're no longer connected to their Gentile family, what do you do with their things? So it's an interesting case. So there was even back then, 1,500 years ago, a Hindu Jewish rabbi mentioned in the Talmud. And there are, of course, lost tribes in, in India. Maybe you've heard of some of the lost tribes are thought to be in India. There's a community called B'nai Menashe. The B'nai Menashe community in India believes themselves to be descendants of the lost tribe of Menashe, that they were exiled, you know, two, two and a half thousand years ago to the far east as well. And it's believed that many of the lost tribes went there to that region, to Afghanistan, for sure there's lost tribes. You know, so a lot of Bukharians say that we're lost tribes, like Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, all, that whole region, and further east in, in India. So the B'nai Menashe believe that they are descendants of Menashe. And there are today many Indians who are not necessarily related to B'nai Menashe, but believe themselves to be Jewish, you know, descendants of Jews and have various interesting traditions and rituals that they think comes from their ancient Jewish ancestors. And even our recent history overlaps. This is another striking parallel because when was the state of Israel formed? 1948. And the partition plan was just a few months earlier in November 1947. And in August 1947, just a few months before that, was when India got independence. Right? So India got independence. They celebrate their independence day on August 15, 1947. That's when India got independence from the British. And then just a few months later, the British also gave up Israel, handed it over to the UN, and the UN partitioned it. So within a year of each other, in less than a year, India and Israel got independence, really from the British, or the British Empire. So that's another thing that links us together. And since then, we've both had issues with our Muslim neighbors. So there's also that whole problem. And so really that makes Israel and India natural allies. I mean, we should be natural allies. So yeah, Israel and India have been actually growing even closer. And this is the most interesting, which, and then I'll finish, because this is just fascinating. In the last century, two among the biggest and most famous Hindu yogis were Jews. In India. Yeah. One was called Swami Vijayanda. World famous people from all over the world come to get, you know, blessings from him. But he's actually a Jew and a Holocaust survivor. And his, you won't believe, his real name, Avram Yitzchak. (laughs) It's funny, but Avram Yitzchak became Swami Vijayanda. He, you you know, now he's tanned with a big beard, but, you know, he, he could be a Hasidic Rebbe. So he was, he was born to a Hasidic family. He survived the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, he was on a ship to Israel. And somebody told him, why are you going to Israel? You just came from war. Over there, there's more war. Go to India. It's peaceful there. Yeah, you should go to India. So he said, all right, I'll try it. So he went to India and ended up becoming a yogi. And now became like world famous. One of the top Hindu yogis in the world. And he's actually Avram Yitzhak from a Hasidic family. But he's Swami Vijayanda to many uh, millions of Hindus. And similar to him is a, a woman, a Jewish woman named Mira Alfasa. Anybody ever hear of Mira Alfasa? So Mira Alfasa was a Sephardi woman, a French Sephardi. She had Turkish, Egyptian uh, parents. And her father was, like all Sephardis, you know, big into Kabbalah and whatever. So she grew up reading his Kabbalah library. And then she became a mystic. She joined a Kabbalistic circle, Hasidic Kabbalistic circle in Poland, and eventually wanted to explore all this mysticism further. Moved to India when she was young. In India, she met a Hindu very famous yogi named Sri Aurobindo. Maybe you've heard of Sri Aurobindo. And he told her that he recognized within her the great divine mother, the cosmic mother, like something like a Hindu Virgin Mary or something, I don't know. But, I usually just pick up one myself. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it works. So, but then he created this whole cult around her. And when, she, when he died in 1950, she took, she took over the movement and it became a massive movement. And she even built a city, which is called Oroville. And uh, it became like, it was supposed to be like a model community. And to this day, people go there to pilgrimage there. And she once had a vision of like a golden dome. And she actually, they built a golden temple. It's, a, it's actually, you should look pictures on the internet. But they built a, a big golden temple. Uh, it's called the Matri Mandir. You know, it's the mother temple. And uh, there's, it's a whole community, and you can go and live there. So people pilgrimage there. They spend six months, a year, to live in nature without electronics, nothing. And it has its own farms, schools, restaurants. It's like a self-sustaining community. 
And there is also an Israeli cafe. So if you ever go there. Oh. And, and it's closed on Shabbat. So uh, it's, I don't know if it's kosher, but it's, I think the whole place is vegan. So. Is she still polytheistic? No, she's, she's passed away, but it's still very Hindu. Yeah, it's, all, it's, like, it's, all, it's like a yoga retreat, basically. People go there for that kind of thing. Yoga, healing, natural living, all that. Since the 60s, people would go there for the whole hippie experience. You know, like Israeli, like IDF soldiers after the army, or like Americans, like the Vietnam years and all that, like leave the West and go and have that whole hippie experience in the East and like get rid of all your belongings and just like sleep on the floor, no electronics and no worries and no money. Anyway, that brings me to my last point, which is that in the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, even more really, there has been a trend of Jews going to the East, Jews looking for meaning and spirituality and Eastern philosophies and Buddhism and Hinduism and other things. And uh, just like Mira Alfasa, just like Rick Strassman, and Rick Strassman's a good example because we should remember that we don't need to go there. We actually have all of this mysticism and spirituality and depth in our, in our Torah, in our Judah. And we really kind of had it first. Really. It all dates back to Avraham, you know, to who's the forefather of, of all of us. And we've carried on this direct tradition, monotheistic as it should be, without any idolatry, you know, for 4,000 years. Whereas in the East, these ideas that may have come from Abraham, but they mixed in with local polytheisms, local idolatries, and over time, they just got jumbled together. And so there is truth there, and it is attractive to people, but it's also mixed with avodah zarah, with idolatry, and there's no need to go there when we have the, the pure, unadulterated version right here. We just have to understand it properly, study our own faith and our own heritage and our own holy text, because they have all of this. The mysticism, the reincarnation, the numerology, the third eye, and the DMT, and whatever you want. Uh, it's all part of the Hebrew tradition as well. So you just have to look in the right places, and you'll find it. We don't have to look east. We just have to look inward, and the true path is, is right here. So we'll end with that.